We're going to be looking specifically this morning at verses 1 to 5, but let me read the entire psalm out to you. These are the words of God. To the chief musician, a psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He also brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth, praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Blessed is that man who makes the Lord his trust and does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. Many, O Lord, my God, are your wonderful works which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire. My ears you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering you did not require. Then I said, Behold, I come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God, and your law is within my heart. I have proclaimed the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O Lord. You yourself know. I have not hidden your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your loving kindness and your truth from the great assembly. Do not withhold your tender mercies from me, O Lord. Let your loving kindness and your truth continually preserve me. For innumerable evils have surrounded me. My iniquities have overtaken me, so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs of my head, therefore my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who seek to destroy my life. Let them be driven backward and brought to dishonor who wish me evil. Let them be confounded because of their shame who say to me, aha, aha. Let all those, let those who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. Let such as love your salvation continually say, the Lord be magnified. But I am poor and needy. Yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. So today we will be examining the first five verses as we come to the conclusion of this series of looking at the book of Psalms for the time being. So with these first five verses, we dive into this wonderful and extremely compelling psalm. The title of this morning's sermon now, I won't be having um, parts on the side for the projector. I'm very sorry about that. But I'm just going to tell you, and I'll try to speak slowly if you're taking notes. So the title of this morning's sermon is Trusting Through Trials. So three T's. We're going to keep the structure relatively simple, so based strategically on each verse. So verse 1 will be David's cry and God's response. Verse 2 is David's rescue, which is God's salvation. Verse 3 is David's gratitude, which God inspires. And verse 4, David's declaration, in which God is made known. And verse 5 will be David's prayer in which God is praised. Now, the main theme of this message will be about the sufficiency of God. God is enough. He allows us to endure through our suffering, and whatever he provides, 
whether it be tangible or intangible, it is sufficient in times of difficulty and despair. And there are times when we are required by God to act, and there are other times when we need only be still. Now, we see prior to going into verse 1, the title clearly ascribes this psalm to King David. It is addressed to the chief musician. He is the primary, primary recipient. Now, some translations will have choir master. Your translation may have music director. Some translations have the leader, which is rather ambiguous and not very specific. I mean, the leader of what? So, this is the part that David probably didn't write, okay? Just like Matthew... He wrote the book of Matthew, but it's in all probability he didn't write the gospel according to Matthew. Someone else would have ascribed that to of the apostolic testimony that Matthew was giving on the work and ministry of Christ. So this, in all probability, was documented by the priests of the temple in such a manner as for this to be the head, the heading as it is. So as we dive into verse 1, it begins with David who waited patiently. Now this is past tense. This is something that's already happened to David. So by the time we get to verse 17, as we've already read, it ends with David waiting again. So David is looking in retrospect as to the goodness of what God has already done, but he's back in that position again where he is waiting and he does not want the Lord to to delay. And that it will be, that's present tense as we go to verse 17. But for now, we will stay in, in these five verses. So, he says, I waited patiently for the Lord. Now, when we wait, it's because we're expecting something. Nobody waits without expectation, or you wouldn't wait, whether you're waiting for a taxi or a bus. You're waiting for someone to come over. You're waiting for the kettle to boil so you can have a cup of tea, especially in this weather when we like to have warm beverages to keep us warm. So, so there is an ex- expectation that we find that David has here. David waits with earnest expectation of his cry to Yahweh, which, as most of us here are hopefully aware, it is the covenantal name of Almighty God. In Hebrew, it reads, literally reads, waiting... I awaited. So it is a doubling down of the same word. It's emphasizing this verb waiting, and it reinforces an accurate translation to say, I waited patiently. So what is David doing while he waits? Well, he's not sitting on his hands. David acknowledges God's faithfulness. David had for many years prior to becoming king, he had been the recipient of of God's faithful mercy. God had enabled David to do amazing things, even in his training to become a warrior, his his initial career as a shepherd, where he was able to rescue lambs from the mouth of bears and lions. That takes great courage. And all this he understands that God had equipped him with. If I was in that position, I'd be, well, it was a cute lamb, but I'm not going after it. David had this courage You know, he absolutely had this, he didn't think of himself. He was thinking of protecting the lamb. He was was thinking of, of his family's honor. He was thinking of doing the right thing rather than the convenient thing. God had enabled him to do this. And and David retells this to Saul in, um, in Samuel 17. 34 to 36. And also in the same chapter in 1 Samuel 17, um, in verses 50 to 51, God enables David to destroy a warrior of such magnitude that an entire army would run away from him. And, and God also allowed for Goliath to underestimate his opponent. Am I a dog that you come to me with stones? God had enabled all this. And what else? After all that, after all of David's many victories, God constantly preserves the life of David from the vile envy and murderous intent of King Saul, a man who was already king, a man who had been anointed by God. 
uh, David was preserved. In 1 Samuel 24, you can read more about that. And now, David, in, as we're reading in Psalm 40, he is king. He is king over Israel. And he knew full well that what Yahweh expected and of those that Yahweh would allow to be king. In Deuteronomy, and if you've got your Bibles, please turn there with me now. In Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14 to 18. So this is what it says. When you come to the land which the Lord your God is giving you and possess it and dwell in it and say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You shall surely set a king over you whom the Lord your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set over you as king. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. He shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. The Lord has, for the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Nor shall he greatly multiply silver and gold for himself. All these things which we know Solomon did. Also it shall be, when he sits on the throne, and this is, this is, this is important, when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandments to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So David has this awareness of God's goodness, of what God had done bringing Israel out of Egypt. Indeed, if, if God hadn't shown Israel favor, bringing them out of captivity, David wouldn't even be king. So David is aware of this. He is no stranger to waiting either. In Psalm 25, verse 5, it says... Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Not some of the day, but there's always this constant expectation that David has from God. And Psalm 39, uh, verse 7, which Pastor Wayne preached on a couple of weeks ago. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. So we've got this anticipation from David. He's hopeful. He's waiting for the Lord. And, and, these, and these past two um, verses we saw were in present tense. That was happening at the time that he wrote them. So getting back to um, Psalm 40 in, in verse 1 still. And he inclined to me and heard my cry. Now, the Hebrew word for inclined is literally that God has bent down. He has, he, has, he has come down. While some translations say reach, which is also appropriate, but it seems inclined, at least to this reader, um, it conveys the idea that God Almighty has in his graciousness condescended and stooped down. So God answers David's prayer and rescues him. So on to verse 2. Where is David being rescued from? Well, we need a little bit of context here, don't we? Now, there's a description here of a horrible pit with miry clay. Now, if there's miry clay, it means that no matter where you step, you're going to slip. There is no sure footing where there's miry clay, and whenever you try to get some traction, you slip, and you get dirtier and dirtier. But David is not referring to a physical situation. As we read this, this psalm tells us vividly of David's distress. He uses literal language to describe this distress. And if you think about it, if you're actually stuck in a deep, boggy pit with no hope of rescue, how do you feel? 
And yet we can all say that spiritually we have been in those places. We may be in them now, some of us. But how do you feel? I, for myself, at the age of around seven or eight, got myself into one of those situations because that's what boys do. And um, there was a velodrome being built just around the corner from where we lived. And like boys, there's a construction site and they want to go and run around and check what, what's going on there. And, um, and I saw this lovely deep hole, which I thought would be great fun to play in. I was by myself. I left my bike there and I jumped in. And I've got to tell you, I didn't think ahead because I couldn't get out. And um, it was a moment of absolute distress mostly because when my parents found out, I'd be in big trouble. But, um, but then I thought to myself, even, even as, as a little boy, I thought to myself, well, I don't want to be in the newspaper because I'll be found the next morning and I don't want to sleep there either. And so it was during that time and I was, there was no point crying out to anyone because no one could hear me. No one could even see my bike laying down next, next to where I decided to um, jump into this hole. And every time I tried to climb out, more gravel kept coming in. Now, I wasn't going to bury myself. I was in no danger. But I did feel isolated. And I was in a situation because the sun was way over the yard arm. The sun, the sun was setting. I knew the dinner wasn't far away. And I was stuck in a hole. And um, it was only through sheer stupidity that I got in there and through desperate ingenuity that I got out when I actually started to realize if I brought enough gravel down, it gave me enough of a platform to leap out, being a, a very spring-legged little boy that I was. But let me tell you, it's, it, was, it was a feeling of absolute isolation. I was walled in. So I know that feeling physically, but also I think we can all know that, that situation spiritually. So, and if I was in David's situation as well, I would, for my part, I would cry out, in sheer desperation, and absolutely, if I knew that there was no one else to help me, I would need God to physically draw me out of a situation. And, and I think many of us here can relate to that, where God is the only one who can save us. He has been the only one who could save us. And it's not because that he was my last option. It's because God is always our best option. Regardless as to who he may bring along, he is the best option and he is answering that call. I'll cry out to him from our heart. And if God in his mercy had, a, in my other situation where I was physically in a hole, if he brought others along to physically help me out, praise God. But that wasn't the situation. And in David, in the, his emotional state, in his spiritual state, it leaves him with no one but God as his first, last and best option. Now, why do I say option? Well, you've got to understand, too, David surrounded himself with counsellors. He could have went to his counsellors. He could have went to one of his wives. He could have went to any number of his friends. Obviously, his best friend, Jonathan, had long since died at this point. But he goes to God because David knows that the attempt to seek help from elsewhere is ultimately going to be folly because in truth he knows, he knows from first-hand experience God's divine help. So how then can we learn from David's experience when each of us fall into our, to our own proverbial pit? When daylight, it seems, does not, does not give us joy, the, the, the rays of sun do not, they seem to have abandoned us for the rays do not give us cheer. The sun does not seem to illuminate the way anymore. Sadly, many remain in such a pit in all their lives. Some, it seems, are even content to stay there if it means that they may hide even perhaps in the sinful depths of their own making. But, however, King David is not such as these. If you can turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9, verses 18 and 19. This is, this is long after um, the southern kingdom of Israel had fallen and, and now many Israelites were living in Babylon. But this is what it says, and this echoes the sentiment of Psalm 40. Oh my God, incline. Again, there's that word, incline, literally to bend down, bow down your ear and hear. 
Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Daniel was interested not so much in salvation, but in the honor of God. And David's outcry was also to esteem Yahweh, that God, not King David, would receive all the honor and glory that he deserves as he rescues his servant. And it can be for us that in our desperate um, desperation of waiting, that we also can be hopeful and that our earnest expectation is for God to incline himself toward us, to sustain us, that we are able to persevere. Waiting, therefore, is an action of faith, not a passive indolence while we wait. We don't wait and be lazy. We are always acknowledging the goodness of God with expectation of his faithfulness. In Psalm 27, verse 14, Psalm 27, verse 14, it says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So there's all this waiting that that we can find in the book of Psalms alone. So, and and continuing on still in verse 2, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. If you've got um, your Bible still open, Jeremiah chapter 10, verses 23 and 24. It says this in Jeremiah chapter 10, 23 and 24. O Lord, you know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. O Lord, correct me but with justice, not in your anger, lest you bring me to nothing. So David is brought to a firm foundation. And again, this is figurative language. David was probably writing this with, with solid bedrock under his feet. But it's, it's that figurative language that he is employing to signify God's rescue. Now, the first recording we have of anyone in the scriptures, being pulled out of a pit is Joseph in Genesis 37, where his own 10 brothers had cast him into a pit out of their jealousy and enmity towards their brother. And Joseph, in the same chapter, in verse 38 of chapter 37, in in chapter, in verse 28, Joseph is brought out of the pit. He is rescued, isn't he? Yes, he is, but no. Yes and no, he's brought out of the pit. But then, after that, we see that trials come again for Joseph, that he goes into slavery. And in Potiphar's house, he is falsely accused of adultery. And then after that, there is subsequent long-term imprisonment after being brought out of a pit. And, we, and again, so that echoes what we see with David. He's been brought out of a pit, but more trials were still to come. And before this psalm is over, and like, like I've already indicated earlier, we see that David is again waiting for the Lord. But let's stay where we are for now. In Psalm 37, verses 23 to 24, it says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. What a wonderful promise. We are given enormous insight as to what we inherit in this life as saints, knowing that we do fall every day. But God sustains us. He picks us up. Even as David, as, as we go into this, and in verse 12 onwards, 
we see the more trials that, that David is going to endure as well. But he will endure. And why will he endure? Not because he is king, not because of his army, not because of his riches, not because of his goodness, not because of his faults, as if you could endure because of your faults, but because Yahweh is faithful. And from beginning to end, he shows mercy on David. That's why he endures. In verse 3, David says, He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. David is inspired to write. God himself has placed a new song. This required no composition from David. God has given it to him. Which brings us to remembrance as well. Um, if, if you want to look in your Bibles, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 to 21. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And that is what David is, what is, what is happening to David now, where God has placed a new song into him. And what other books... Can, what other book throughout the history of books can make such a legitimate claim as God's holy word that we have in the Bible preserved for us today for our instruction and edification and for his glory? So even so, through David's prayers, there is rescue and there are still ongoing troubles. We see the Holy Spirit's guidance and ultimate inspiration that causes David to write from the dictates that God has placed in his mouth, resulting in a song of praise to our God. David begins with the self-reference, so it begins, begins with God, who puts it into David. He says, my mouth, which results in a song of praise to our God. It is something that is going to be shared. It is something that's going to be utilized by the chief priest as a song of proclamation in the temple that the world may know the goodness of the Lord. And David rightly desires for this declaration of God's mercy to be for public hearing, as all the Psalms are. And this isn't the first time, as we all know, that God puts words into his servants' mouths. We see, if you want to read in Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 to 12, there's a conversation between the Lord and Moses. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent neither now nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf? the seeing or the blind. Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. And this isn't the last time either. We, we, we look in uh, the New Testament, in Mark chapter 13, 11. God puts words into the apostles' mouth. Jesus reassures his apostles. He says, but when they arrest you, not if, but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. So, what is the result of David's inspiration? Many see and many will fear and many will put their trust in the Lord. 
King David's previous personal sufferings, it seems, is common knowledge amongst the people of Israel because the people saw it with their eyes. They saw David was healed. And because of their great fear, that is righteous and holy fear, they too believe and place their faith in God because David demonstrates at this time sound leadership for the people. And could it be that we could all go through such trials or perhaps some of us are going through or have been through? But how do we respond? Could it be that our fear of God is actually a wonderful reaction to our trials? Proverbs, uh, Proverb 9, verse 10 Fear the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So, if we're fearing the Lord during a time of trial, we can have wisdom during that time. Well, that's a good thing. So, therefore, fearing the Lord is, is, a, is, a, is a wonderful approach to our, to our troubles initially. Ecclesiastes um, chapter 12, verse 13. After all that's gone on, after all the expo- exposition that's gone on through Ecclesiastes, it comes to this. Let us hear the conclusion in chapter 12, verse 13. The conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. Now, the fact that the writer of Ecclesiastes, possibly Solomon, had to even write this, it shouldn't, he shouldn't have even needed to write this, but he has written it. And it needs to be there because we are so forgetful. We are sinful and dim-witted. We need these reminders that we need to fear him and keep his commandments. For this is man's all. It's not just a part. It is something that is required and it's something we need to be conscious of all the time. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 7, it says this, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. So the fear of God is a wonderful and beautiful response to any trials that we go through. Peter also gives wonderful encouragement and I would, I would encourage you to, to turn to this now. When the hour of trial comes, it says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. If you're ever looking for something new as a memory verse, I would encourage you to go for this. 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 to 12. In this, you greatly rejoice. What are they rejoicing in? They're rejoicing that we who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's what they're rejoicing in, being kept for faith, for the revelation of self, for, for the salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. That's what they're rejoicing over. In fact, you know what? Just read all of that chapter one. For though in a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied that the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, the Spirit of Christ who was in them, 
was indicating when he testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed, not to themselves, but to us. They were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. So the people's response, seeing, fearing, and trusting in the Lord. We turn to verse 4. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. The result of seeing and fearing. And does not respect the proud, nor such as turn aside to lies. The Bible has nothing to good, nothing good to say about the proud or the haughty. Obadiah verses 3 to 4. You don't have to turn to it. It's just one chapter, but if you want to, you can. Obadiah verses 3 and 4 it says this. This is concerning the Edomites. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart, who will bring me to the ground? Though you ascend as high as an eagle, and though you set your nest in the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. You are never too high for God to not reach you, and you are never too low, as David has experienced, for God to reach you either. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 17, it says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And this world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. These these give us wonderful encouragement and reactions that, that we can discipline ourselves during times of trials, during times where we feel like we are in a pit when despair, it seems, is overwhelming us. But it is, within the, it is within the echo chamber of unrepentance that pride, that pride manifests itself greatly. It is, and of itself, not only sin, but the perpetuator of further sins. As the fallen mind in its carnal state justifies its depraved behavior and announces its vile and wicked actions as a good thing. And when, instead of trusting in the Lord, such people continue to turn aside to lies. And we don't have to look too far, especially in this day and age, to see the tragic results of celebrating sin and depravity. Let's look now to verse 5. Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works, which you have done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. In this doxology, David remains humble which is the opposite to pride. King David expresses his thankfulness by praising the God of his salvation. How wonderful to be pulled out of the pit and not only stand upon sure rock, that is is the assurance of God's word and following God, but also to know that God will guide his steps toward righteousness as well. but also God's thoughts towards us. God's thoughts toward us cannot be counted. Now, I've never really considered that before until I 
was actually looking at this at, at when I was when I was examining this uh, wonderful psalm, and it really gave me a great moment of pause. We can't even we they the God's thoughts towards us they can't even be arranged in any manner for us to count them either. Almighty God thinks of his elect. He thinks of his chosen people. But we are but dust. But he thinks of us. How can anyone read this and not be moved? David knows he is inadequate. He knows he is ultimately unable to fathom the depths of God's love and even understand the thoughts of Almighty God. Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9. Many of us know this. Isaiah 55, 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So this gives us clear perspective, doesn't it? of the unreachable difference between the thoughts of God compared to the thoughts of man, though we are bearers of his image. We are inadequate. Oh, great, you walk in, well, I'm inadequate, that's great. That's it, you can go now. You're inadequate. We need to understand, because we're inadequate, that's why he bends down, that's why he has to condescend in order to save us, to do what he did for what he did to David, who wasn't in a literal hole, but he was still in great spiritual distress, crying out to the Lord. So God condescends, and he has done this in these last days by his son, through Jesus Christ himself, who has, has ultimately fulfilled what David was crying out for, to do not delay. He has already done it. Jesus Christ, who is himself the covenantal God in flesh. God in flesh, who has come and has saved us. If you turn in your Bibles to Titus, chapter 3, verses 4 to 9, it says this, Titus chapter 3, 4 to 9. But when the kindness and the love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of repentance and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And like Jonah in the Old Testament, like Jonah, we can also pray this prayer. Though Jonah literally, again, he, like Joseph was literally in a hole, this physically happened to Jonah. Jonah prayed this, and this is a prayer that I think we could all pray. When, when we are in our own boggy mire that we can't get out of. Jonah says in chapter 2, verses 6 to 9, he said, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. He didn't have a chance. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit. O oh Lord, my God, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you into your holy temple. He heard Jonah. Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. Jonah had no other thing to sacrifice. I will pay what I have vowed. Why? He concludes, salvation is of the Lord. 
And for those of us familiar with this prayer, the result was the great fish spat him up onto the shores of Nineveh. And the work that God did through this reluctant prophet is, to say the least, remarkable. And like Jonah, who spent three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so too Jesus was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And it shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who believe in Christ, in him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was because of our justification that we may now have peace with God the Father through his Son, Jesus Christ. That God could reconcile and bring to himself a people. Now, in closing... Through this psalm of David, the Holy Spirit educates us, encourages, and most importantly, prepares us for whatever trials may come. In our tactile attempts to alleviate the symptoms of any great distress, we instead need to cultivate a discipline and a desire to wait patiently on the Lord. For to him we belong, and to him we are accountable, and in him alone do we acknowledge the complete and total salvation of our souls. From Christ's completed work on the cross to his resurrection and ascension into heaven, we who are in Christ have full assurance Regardless of our trials, we have full assurance of the complete security of God. We will endure because God is faithful. Jesus said to his followers, in this world, you will have tribulation. Not might, not maybe. You will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. For all of you who are servants of Christ, who are saints, you have this blessed assurance. He will guide your steps, for you are continually in the thoughts of God Almighty. Don't forget that. For those of us here who are not in Christ, but who are earnestly seeking God, if you are earnestly seeking Him, that you may know true peace, that you may know reconciliation with him, I implore you this day to repent, to surrender to Jesus Christ, the overcomer of this world, that you may know him, love him, and follow him who calls you out of darkness into his wonderful light. All glory be to God. Let's, let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, may we learn what it is to truly trust you. May the faith which you have given to us grow greatly during times of strife and immense difficulty. For you, Father, have allowed such times as these that we would turn to you, knowing that you who are so wonderful and what you have done and what you have provided for us from your abundant mercies is enough for us to give you the glory and praise that you deserve in all circumstances. Thank you, Father, for your eternal security that you have given to your people, that we may always look unto Christ, who is eternal, rather than our earthly trials, which are temporary. To you, O Lord, be all honour, praise, and glory now and forevermore. Amen.